thank you, Dr. Bhushan, respected chairpersons, and my dear friends. I know it's a race against time, lot of slides. And uh, just a quick word. First of all, heartiest congratulations to the Amravati Society. And I am I had my early schooling here in, at Holy Cross Convent. So there is a lot of bonding that I share with all of you, really. So that's right. So opinion poll, let's have a quick opinion poll. Lutal phase supplement, is, is it required in normal spontaneous cycle? Whether it's required when you do ovulation induction with clomiphene, with letrozole, with gonatropin, or when you have an IVF with agonist protocol or antagonist protocol, and of course, uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. So these are various options that we have. And at times, these are all confusing. And I also was equally confused till I met these two gentlemen. And then uh, a lot of things really fell into place. So do we really need to give support in the luteal phase at all? The answer is very much yes, especially when there is a stimulated cycle. And mind you, in fertility practice, most of the cycles are stimulated. Can you you'll see the bell-shaped curve when you have, a uh, uh, it's much taller and shorter. That is something very different from the normal cycle. Now, a stimulated cycle you'll see, you'll have multiple follicles. There's a supraphysical level of estrogen that really uh, is very much there and supraphysical levels of progesterone also. And what really it happens, the thing is, there is an advancement of endometrium that happens and the cycles tend to be shorter. So they have patients as early menses. And if it's an agonist cycle, mind you, there is down regulation of the LH receptors. This again contributes for uh, deficiency of the luteal phase. So both agonist cycle as well as antagonist cycle, which you have, which we normally use in infertility, see both are known to cause what is popularly known as luteal phase defects. Now, uh, now this is a data which shows that when you have an agonist cycle, uh, what is the level of advancement that occurs? That's the single most important thing that you must remember. It's two to five days of secretory advancement that occurs in 100% patients. Now, this picture you will see in a natural cycle, there, there are no secretory features on the day of ovulation. While when you do ovum pickup, on the same day you have secretory features. That means the secretory features come well in advance on the day of ovum pickup, which is something which is unusual. That doesn't happen in natural cycle. When you have an antagonist cycle, the same thing. You have two to four days of advancement. Now, does this advancement, which I'm talking about, really does it make a difference? Well, yes. You will see when the advancement is less than three days, pregnancies do happen. But whenever the advancement of the endometrium occurs more than three days, no pregnancies occur. So this is an important thing. And advancement occurs because of the stimulation that we have given and it is dependence on the on the level of steroids that happens just a minute huh? i think okay so ovarian super ovulation or hyper stimulation it destroys the luteal phase function both in terms of endocrinology as well as the uh, endometrium behavior and the level of advancement as i told you is dependent on the luteal phase steroid production they have supraphysical levels of both estrogen and progesterone and most important, obviously, in GnRH agonist and antagonist cycle, when there is no support, well, the endometrium is irreceptive to the embryo. Now, how do we redeem this situation? Well, number one, correct the underlying factors, especially when you have hyperprotectinemia, when you have PCOS, thyroid dysfunction. We understand, yes, these are potential uh, 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 areas where you have uh, luteal phase defects. And most important, then offer luteal phase support. Now, what sort of luteal phase support are going to... Uh, uh, See, so Cochrane has spelled out that it's either human chorine gonatropin or progesterone. They give better pregnancy rates when no support is given. So definitely there is a, 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 a point. And what sort of luteal phase? We understand the luteal phase is basically dominated by the LH hormone and progesterone. So these are the two things, two molecules that we are going to use for luteal phase support. The HCG, remember it's a surrogate LH, 87% homologous. So we said LH is not available in clinical practice, so we are going to use SCG and uh, uh, of course progesterone as well. Now SCG, remember, uh, is a, uh, it causes the final mature is the oocyte and triggers ovulation, but most important, it is known to increase the re uh, level of OR and hypothyroidism syndrome. So this is one dreaded thing that happens with SCG. Now it has been hypothesized, well SCG could be better than progesterone because it is it produces molecules which probably 
are beyond pro progesterone. And therefore, it was suggested that probably instead of progesterone, you give HCG. Well, sounds good. And then came the first meta-analysis, which did show that HCG did produce uh, better results than progesterone. But remember, or equal results than progesterone. But, but uh, the, the, the OHS went up. That is one disadvantage that uh, was mentioned in this particular meta-analysis. Now, which progesterone preparation? Now, all over Europe and USA, the standard of care is with intramuscular progesterone. So, every other progesterone that we use will get compared to the intramuscular progesterone. Whether it is vaginal progesterone, the oral progesterone, the oral synthetic progesterone, the subcutaneous that come, and the vaginal ring, which probably is not available today for us at the moment. Now, intramuscular progesterone, which I told you, is a standard of care, 20 film of progesterone, no hepatic pass, absorption rapid. Now, the thing is, uh, the peak levels uh, they, uh, uh, are reached within two hours, and they are sustained within eight hours as well. But there are disadvantages, remember, and the disadvantage, of course, we all understand, it's painful, it, it may cause abscesses, and the dreaded one, the, uh, the allergic response and the acute eosinophilic pneumonia, that, of course, ha may happen in few cases. So this is something about the intramuscular progesterone, and every other progesterone will get compared to this one. So the research was on to find a new method of delivery of progesterone, and the Belgium scientists, the Belgium clinicians went ahead, and they gave us what is called as the natural, uh, vaginal natural micronized progesterone. This is something that we all have been using. And what is it? It's a targeted delivery of progesterone to the uterus and the endometrium. The endometrial tissue levels of progesterone are tenfold higher in the endometrium as compared to the, uh, that you get in the serum. So that's important. Homogeneous distribution of progesterone throughout the endometrium in four hours. That is another big advantage of vaginal progesterone. It suggests a proper endometrial effect and a secret transfer. See, ultimately the embryo has to implant. And what is required is a secret transformation. And that is something that vaginal progesterone would give. And the dose, 50 to 100 milligrams of vaginal progesterone is amount amounts approximate to the pro uh, production rate of progesterone by normal corpus luteum. So this is perfect that you would like to use in your daily practice. And the dose, therefore, would be 100 milligrams given 12 hourly. Well, a slight staining of the undergarments, that is what has been mentioned. Now, uh, uh, the th this is a sponsored session and we have uh, sustain that is available. And what has been, it has a unique delivery system. What it does, it the effervescent technology widens the intercellular space, which enhances paras paracellular and the transcellular absorption of progesterone. So this is one advantage which this vaginal particular uh, technology really gives. Now, but how does it compare? And therefore, uh, this was a study which was done by the Belgian group, uh, 300 to 600 milligrams compared with 100 milligrams. Per, uh, uh, it gave, remember, the same histological transformation. So you could use vaginal progesterone instead of intramuscular progesterone. What do you use? Uh, in case you use the same progesterone orally, the transformation did not really happen. And this is something, a point that we must really keep in mind. Now, uh, then came the first RCT. The first RCT, what did it mention? That the higher pregnancy rate and implantation rate with vaginal progesterone. So this came as the first RCT when we compared the two. But the meta-analysis which came did not show this. But more, mind you, the meta-analysis had many studies where the progesterone that was given was much lower, 100 to 200 milligram. But further, uh, larger studies showed very clearly that vaginal progesterone, it could be the tablet or the gel, compared equally as compared to the intramuscular progesterone. Same thing, whether you use the agonist cycle or use the antagonist cycle. So, so in all IVF cycles, remember, vaginal progesterone does equally good as compared to intramuscular progesterone. So finally, it depends on Cochrane. So what does Cochrane say? That yes, vaginal progesterone, intramuscular, intramuscular progesterone, and HC supplements have similar IVF pregnancy rates. So this is something that we need to understand. But remember, SCG should not be given because it causes OR and hypersensitive syndrome, and progesterone should be preferred one when it compares to luteal phase support in IVF cycles. What about SCG? SCG does it have a role? Yes, it has a role, especially when you have an agonist cycle. So agonist cycle, remember, causes the good number of oocytes as compared to the SCG trigger. But the problem with uh, agonist trigger is that it it causes problems to the luteal phase. And therefore, Humadan, Peter Humadan came out with this protocol of adding 
adding a small dose of hcg along with uh, uh, along with your agonist trigger and he showed that there was no uh, or and hapel syndrome and the success remains the same but remember we need require more studies on this what about oral micronized progesterone remember uh, we understand it's ineffective in causes secret transformation it lacks uh, adequate efficacy uh, there are other problems as well as flushing nausea fluid retention but the sustained release which is now probably the marketed by every company where does it really stand this high protein binding of 90 to 99% allows one steady dose so this is an advantage but remember we do not have sufficient data to say that it can be used in ivf cycles so we have to fall back on uh, our vaginal progesterone what about didrogestron well again it's uh, 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 again the convenience of use and the studies have shown non inferiority of uh, didrogestron to vaginal progesterone see because again didrogestron will have to be compared to uh, either intramuscular progesterone or vaginal progesterone so <coughs> both it uh, whether it compared to the gel or the tab tablet it fares equal uh, with equal efficient uh, equal efficacy subcutaneous aqueous progesterone the intramuscular is painful so they brought about the subcutaneous where does it stand again non inferiority studies have shown that the results are at par so you could use subcutaneous uh, 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 micronized progesterone uh, uh, in case you don't want to use an intramuscular progesterone so is, now what about ad addition of estrogen to your progesterone well studies showed that yes that yes adding estrogen didn't make a difference but equal number of studies showed that it didn't make a difference and a large meta analysis finally showed that there is no difference of whether you add estrogen or no estrogen only this particular study showed when you add added a vaginal estrogen that really made a difference to your results so what about adding gnrh agonist to your uh, to your protocol as a luteal phase support very interesting now addition of gnrh agonist especially given on the 6th day remember gave a better pregnancy rate so this is again a <coughs> forest plot and it showed that adding gnrh agonist remember in the luteal phase gave success so what about clomiphene citrate which we normally use well do you need to give support studies have shown that there is it's not really required and meta analysis clearly showed that progesterone uh, uh, luteal phase support may be of benefit to patients who are giving who are given gonadotropins through mean iui cycles but not whenever clomiphene citrate was used now this is very interesting and i follow back on professor ever study professor ever mentioned that whenever you have a single follicle it produces enough progesterone to support the luteal phase no further progesterone is required and most of our clomiphene citrate cycles remember are mono mono follicular remember just about 20 30% of them will be multi uh, multi follicular so luteal phase is required whenever you have two or more follicles because why because then the ratio of estrogen progesterone gets distorted and you have luteal phase insufficiency and when you use gonadotropins well the purpose is to you to to produce more than one follicle so the moment you have two follicles remember the ratio is going to get distorted so you must add luteal phase support okay and vaginal progesterone is versatile you can use oral the gel the the subcutaneous the way you want it now recurrent miscarriages of course the graph is very clear the forest plot it favors progesterone so when you have a case of of uh, recurrent pregnancy loss unexplained give progesterone but most important you must start progesterone immediately after soon after ovulation and not after the period is missed the, the purpose otherwise will be defeated so how do you summarize so let let's fall back on again cochrane who has summarized us for us that hcg and progesterone given the luteal phase are associated with higher live birth rate remember as compared to no placebo so give luteal phase whenever it's a stimulated cycle hcg may increase the risk of ohss so hcg is not to be given as the luteal phase support now root of progesterone administration or addition of estrogen does not appear to make any difference okay so you you can choose the route that best suits you and addition of gnr is agonist to progesterone appears to to improve success so this is one thing take home, uh, take home that we have so how do you use it in practice the optimal dose intramuscular 50 to 100 mg the daily dose if it's a subcutaneous it's 25 mg of daily dose vaginal in case you it's an iui cycle it's 200 mg which is divided into as 100 mg twice a day is an ivf cycle uh, give 600 mg daily divided again as 
200 milligrams thrice a day or gel 90 milligrams single dose. Optimal start, when do you start uh, progesterone IUI? Two to four days after ovulation, remember. In case you have three follicles, one has ruptured, don't be in a hurry to start progesterone. Let all three ruptures and then you start your progesterone. You have a fairly wide window. But it's an IVF cycle, is 24 to 48 hours after the USAT retrieval. And optimal dose, when do you stop progesterone? Well, what is said is the, after the first positive beta HCG, but most of us will continue till 8 weeks or even till 12 weeks as well. Now, we had the great uh, pleasure of felicitating and celebrating Durga means India's first IVF baby. And mind you, you may not know that she's world's second IVF baby, but world's first IVF baby with gonadotropins, with frozen embryo transfer. So this is something that we must be really proud as Indians. So we gave the world the first gonadotropin baby and first frozen embryo transfer baby. But mind you, when you are using gonadotropins, when you are using frozen embryo transfer, it is progesterone support. That is most important. So thank you very much. I know I had to rush through many things and thank you for the patient listening. Thank you organizers for inviting me once again and thank you uh, Sanjay, uh, Yogesh and the son for helping me to make my journey very comfortable. Thank you very much really.